I have been absolutely fascinated with the foundational structure of Teyvat's planet since the release of Unreconciled Stars. As soon as Scaramouche declared the sky as fake, I knew we were in for something a bit more complex than a planet with some floating sky islands. But after the event was over, there was just no more mention of this weird false sky. No books, no events, just nothing. Everyone just carries on like nothing ever happened and the sky totally didn't fall down. Sure, we get a tiny microscopic hint here and there that kinda sorta gives a subtle nod to a potential piece of information that may be applicable to the greater cosmology of the game eventually, but every little bit of new information we get in every new plot point just leaves me with so many more questions to answer. Like, why is the moon always full, and where are these other two moons that Teyvat is supposed to have? And is the abyss supposed to be in another dimension? And is Conria actually underground? What exactly is this cloudy pillar loading screen supposed to be? Where, where is it, even? And where exactly do we go when we enter a domain? Now, over the last year, I have attempted to answer a few of these questions independently, some more successfully than others, but today I think I finally have a theory that manages to answer all of these questions I had about the world of Teyvat, and I am here to share it with all of you. That means this video will be solely focused on explaining things like the structure of the planet, continental layouts, how the magic and energy systems work within the system, and all of those sorts of things. So, sit back, relax, and engage the brain because this is Radiation Theory Part 3, The World Structure of Teyvat. Just a heads up, I will be debunking several of my own theories here, or at least I will be making arguments that contradict theories I've proposed in the past. That is okay. It doesn't make those theories less valid or entertaining to think about, it just means that they don't work within the context of the theory presented within this video. I am also going to be approaching this theory in more of a this is how it works fashion rather than go into the how or the why it works in this way. This may sound like a bit of a cop out since I'm basically just ignoring all of the reasoning and explanation, but keeping in all of the hows and whys resulted in a really muddy and confusing mess and I just wasn't okay with that. I will definitely be covering the hows and whys and all of my reasonings to go along with them, but I'm going to do so in a separate video so that everything is clear and concise and all kind of meshes together in the end. Which means that this series now has a part four. <sighs> and as if I haven't said it enough already, I'll remind you again. This is a theory video. Pretty much everything in this video is just my own assumptions and speculations drawn from my own research. Sources for my claims will be cited and linked in the description box for convenience. Also, please make sure to check the pinned comment for any corrections or annotations post the video's release. All of my theory videos have this feature because I want to make sure I am providing the best information possible and YouTube doesn't let me put video annotations in anymore. That's a really old feature, so I am stuck with pinned comments. Yay! Uh, this video is also part three of a series, so if you haven't watched the previous two, I suggest you go do so, although it's not really necessary. Alrighty, with all that fussy stuff out of the way, let's dive in. I kind of mentioned this earlier, but we don't really know a whole lot about the world of Teyvat, or the planet it belongs to. But what we do know is fairly straightforward. Teyvat is both a world and a continent made up of seven nations, each governed by an Archon. The primary landmass is surrounded by an area known as the Dark Sea, which, contrary to its name, isn't just a sea because it also includes other landmasses like islands. We also know that the sky is fake, with stars that are within the planet's atmosphere. These stars form constellations that foretell people's destinies and are basically solid rocks instead of gaseous bodies. Teyvat is also supposed to have three moons orbiting the planet, but there's only one moon visible in the sky, and that moon is always full, which means it's always perpendicular to the sun, which is pretty weird. There's also supposed to be an underground nation called Conria somewhere, as well as a place known as the Abyss, which also exists somewhere, probably, maybe in a separate dimension or something. Okay, that part's not as straightforward. 
Uh, but meanwhile, on the magic-y side of things, the planet of Teyvat is home to an enormous network of elemental energy known as ley lines that run through the entirety of the world, including the sky. Those same ley lines appear to function like a massive root system and feed back into the world tree, which is kind of invisible and doesn't appear to have a fixed location, but in many ways is kind of like the heart of the world, pumping energy through it in the same way a real heart would pump blood through the body. Now, I have analyzed and scrutinized this fairly limited set of information, and after much careful consideration and imagination, I have concluded that the world of Teyvat basically looks like... this. Ta-da! Well, yeah, I know it's a picture of a fancy tree, but it's also a pretty good representation of how the world of Teyvat looks. I am sensing a lot of skepticism here. So in that case, allow me to explain exactly how I got here. You remember the world tree I mentioned earlier, right? Well, that world tree has its uh, <clears throat> roots in a fair amount of mythologies from around the world. Of those, the most famous is the Norse tree Yggdrasil. That's the tree depicted in this image, and that's what I'm going to be using as the scaffolding of this world structure analysis. Now, Yggdrasil is the tree at the very center of all of Norse cosmology. It connects each of the nine worlds together, and its branches extend over the entirety of the sky. Teyvat's world tree also covers the entirety of the sky and supposedly connects at least two worlds together. That's why I picked Yggdrasil as our starting point. If you're not sure why I say the tree covers the entire sky, then you probably never watched this video of mine where I talked about the fall sky. That's okay. I will provide a quick and dirty summary of that video's conclusions here, but you may want to check it out later anyway for a more thorough explanation. So I will leave a link to that below. Basically, during the 1.1 event, Unreconciled Stars, we learned that not only was the sky fake, but that the stars were nothing more than rocks hanging somewhere above the stratosphere. Then, during the first energy amplifier event, we learned about the existence of powerful stones called Irminsul fruit. These so-called Irminsul that the fruit belong to are actually what we call those petrified trees we find within domains, and those trees appear to be a part of a greater ley line network that runs throughout the entire world, making the domain Irminsul trees and the world tree one and the same. Or rather, the Irminsul appears to be offshoots or stray branches of the world tree. Because we know that ley lines contain all of the memories of everything that ever existed within Teyvat, and that those ley lines flow through the world tree, we drew the logical conclusion that the stars in the sky, which bore a startling visual likeness to the Irminsul fruit, must actually be Irminsul fruit. And since that fruit grows on branches, then the branches of the world tree must cover the entire sky. And recently, this was basically confirmed in the description for the Geospectre enemies. We also see parts of this process in action thanks to Hu Tao's story quest, where she walks us through the process of returning a lost soul back to the ley lines where all souls are supposed to go after death. And not just souls. Everything upon its death or destruction is eventually returned to the ley lines where it circulates through the Irmin soul and the world tree. They are then broken down into raw elemental energy and memories that continue to flow through the ley lines until it is their time to return to the world. As far as the Irminsul fruit stars are concerned, it's likely that the memories may even coagulate within the world tree's branches sometime during this process, becoming encapsulated within said fruits that then form a constellation. This is probably why, when Leonard's constellation fell from the sky, we were able to see his memories even though he'd been dead for hundreds of years. Now let me be very, very clear. The world tree is a lot less literal than the Irminsul trees we see within domains, since those actually have a physical form. Think of the world tree not so much as a physical tree with barks and leaves and all of that, but more of a tree-like energy field. It's something that exists everywhere, but you can't really see it until it decides to manifest in the form of outcrops, blossoms, or earminsel branches. So those, uh, you know, domain trees. Okay, so big magic energy tree is great and all, but that doesn't really explain the whole planetary structure, does it? Well, no, but 
I don't think Teyvat is a planet at all. I think Teyvat is actually a biosphere that exists somewhere on a planet that we haven't seen yet, most likely completely submerged underwater. I know it's a hot take, but here's the thing. Genshin's primary source of inspiration for its world comes from Gnosticism. And Gnosticism is a branch of Christianity which shares its cosmology with a Hebrew worldview. And that worldview looks something like this. In this cosmology, the Earth is depicted as a relatively flat chunk of rock floating amidst an endless sea with a thick barrier known as the firmament completely covering one side. The firmament kept the waters away from the land and made up the sky, thus creating space for humans to live. This dome was held up by divine pillars, also known as the pillars of heaven, and were not limited to just the edges of the firmament. Apparently, many of the pillars were invisible and scattered all across the land. Teyvat shares most of these features. The firmament can be likened to a false sky. The continent of Teyvat is that flat-ish landmass in the middle with space for an underground region which we'll talk about later, and it's all surrounded by a wide sea with small islands or mountains which resemble the description we have of the dark sea. The sun, the moon, and stars are also all on the inside of the firmament, just like how the stars in Genshin are contained within the Earth's atmosphere instead of being millions of light years away. You'll also notice that this model is encased entirely in water, and I think that might be the case for Genshin as well, but we'll talk about that later, just keep it in the back of your mind for now. Now, if you take the concept of the Irminsul world tree and overlay it on top of this firmament model of the world, you'll end up with something that looks a bit like this. And I know this model has some obvious problems, like if the sky is a solid barrier, then how did the twins fall from the sky and into Teyvat? And where is the loading screen supposed to be that, you know, gives us this weird door that goes inside of Teyvat? And domains, where are they? And what about this big empty space down where the roots of the tree are? Well, don't worry, we'll get to that. But let me stay on this whole biosphere idea for a bit. Some of you may remember my very first Genshin theory video I made over a half a year ago where I tried to draw parallels between Genshin and Honkai Impact. Let me debunk my own theory. In that video, I proposed that Honkai Impact's Project Arc, which was basically a backup of humanity that got launched into space, is in fact Teva. The basis for this was that the word Teva means Arc in Hebrew, so this seemed like a pretty natural conclusion to come to. However, I now believe that Project Arc is something completely separate and that the naming similarities are there because both Project Arc and Teyvat serve the same purpose while being completely separate things. Now, generally speaking in mythological terms, an Arc is a vessel that keeps various things safe in the event of a disaster. The most famous Arc was a wooden ship made by Noah as a means to rescue animals and humans when God flooded the Earth. Honkai Impact took this concept and turned their arc into a spaceship, but it ultimately was built to fulfill the same purpose, to preserve the source data of humanity in case their world was destroyed. By this logic, it would only make sense that Teyvat is also an arc that serves a similar purpose, not a boat or a spaceship, but a biosphere, a bubble world. Not to be confused with the bubble universe a la Honkai, but I am suggesting that the continent of Teyvat has been bubbled within a firmament, thus resulting in a flat-ish section of land encased within a sphere. Note that the firmament cosmological structure in Hebrew scripture depicts nothing but water outside of the firmament itself. While it may have been metaphorical there, there's evidence to suggest that it may be literal in the context of Teyvat. And it all starts with Scaramouche as does everything. Just like a bubble on the water. Beautiful for a moment, then total destruction. Originally, I thought this line of his was solely in reference to the Raiden Shogun's flawed view of eternity, since a lot of her themes revolve around the Diamond Sutra, which talks a lot about the philosophy of illusory bubbles on the water, which I will not get into right now. 
While that may still be the case, we have to remember that this line is coming from the same guy who said, The stars, the sky, it's all a gigantic hoax, a lie. And we can kind of confirm his statement here. There is enough in-game evidence to prove this from the always full moon to the non-gaseous stars in the sky that dictate the fate of all humans. So what if he's got it right a second time? What if Teyvat is a literal bubble on the water? A type of arc submerged and hidden away to keep what's left of humanity safe. But safe from what? That explanation will have to wait. For now, just roll with me because I mainly want to focus on the physical aspects of the world rather than get lost in the story of how it all happened. We will save that for the next video. In any case, if Scaramouche's words are to be taken literally, it would line up quite well with the Gnostic cosmology as the world being within a firmament bubble, partially or completely submerged within the primordial waters. But it also means that Teyvat is a very small chunk of land sequestered beneath the sea on a much larger planet. Remember this for later, I want to talk about something else first. Now, the firmament itself is kind of a weird concept, but I think it's best to imagine it like it's a big hollow glass ball. Again, a biosphere, if you will, with Teyvat filling the ball halfway. At the center of this sphere, we place the world tree, which can only grow until it reaches the firmament before its branches and roots have to spread out. This creates a layer on the inside of the firmament where the sun, moon, and stars will appear. The firmament is anchored at the edges of the dark sea on high mountains that are usually called the foundations of heaven, but it's often also called the pillars of heaven. You'll notice that in some visual depictions of the firmament cosmology, there are additional pillars added to the primary landmass itself. This is very notable because the world tree is known as an Irminsul tree in Genshin, and the word Irminsul means great pillar in Old Saxon. This implies that the world tree and its many smaller offshoots may also be considered pillars of heaven and play an important role in holding up the sky, or rather, the firmament. Remember that every region we've been to so far has had at least one really special tree. We have Ejdaha's prison in Liwe, the Thunderbird's perch and the sacred Sakura in Inazuma, as well as the great tree at Windrise in Mondstadt and the frostbearing tree in Dragonspine, which is also technically Mondstadt, I guess. If you watched part one of this series, you'll remember that Dragonspine used to have a different Irminsul tree that ended up being destroyed by Celestia when they dropped the Skyfrost nail. The death of this tree threw the local leyline network into complete disarray, forcing the once lush and fertile mountain into an eternal winter. By my estimates, the disaster of Sol Vindignir should have occurred around the time of the Archon War, or right around the time Celestia began the contest for the Thrones of the Seven. Theoretically. The timeline of the ancient events in this game are pretty vague right now, but this assumption should be accurate based on what little information we have currently. That could change. Anyway. Also back in part one of this series, I talked about how the statues of Seven and the teleport points were likely placed on key ley line junctures all around the world, artificially pumping energy in and out of the natural ley line veins like regulators. And I do think this is still the case, only rather than being a monitoring program, they appear to be more of a failsafe in the event of another Dragonspine meltdown. An artificial pillar of heaven put in place to ensure that the sky doesn't crumble and the tree doesn't cease its functions. It therefore stands to reason that the true job of the Archons is to govern over their heavenly pillars which ensures the safety of the Ark. By this same logic, the heart of an Archon, or their Gnosis, is basically granting them this ability to hold up the sky, if you will. A side effect of this ability would be a sharp boost in their power since they'd have full access to the raw elemental energy within their own section of the ley line network. Even the design of the Gnosis itself could be a nod to the heavenly pillars. Yes, they are shaped like chess pieces, but when you really look at them, they could very easily be interpreted as tiny pillars, you know? But all this talk of pillars brings one really iconic thing to mind. 
the loading screen and the location of the twins at the very start of the game. This location is just an endless sea of clouds and pillars. Nothing but pillars as far as the eye can see until a door finally appears and allows us to enter Teyvat. Yet we've never seen any place in game that even comes close to matching this location. One thing I didn't mention earlier when we were talking about the firmament is the fact that it's not one solid piece. The firmament does have windows and doors. A place held up by pillars that stretches over what seems to be the entire world just beyond a false sky that blots out the true sun and moon, a cloudy sky with pillars and windows and doorways. Is it possible then that this place is actually the inside of the firmament? I think it very well might be. Okay, so you know that the firmament has windows and doors, but I didn't mention that it has one other very important feature. It has a gate. This gate is known as the gate of heaven, and it's really more of a portal, I guess. It's a literal doorway to divinity, or a spiral staircase from which God can descend to the earth. A lot of firmament descriptions don't mention the gate of heaven, which makes things quite complicated when you're trying to figure out how two stars like Aether and Lumine can fall from the sky when the whole sky is supposed to be an impenetrable dome. The existence of a divine gate through which a god can descend really solves this conundrum, especially if you think that the twins are actually gods, which I think might be a possibility. <clears throat> but anyway, uh, this gate also reminds me of something. I think it's uncanny how the wishing screen looks just like all of these artist interpretations of the gate of heaven, clouds and all. However, Aether and Lumine didn't fall to Teyvat, supposedly. They should have fallen to Conria, which is supposed to be beneath Teyvat. So how does that work? How do you fall underground? Well, the wishing screen isn't the only thing that looks like the gate of heaven. This does too. This is basically our view from the bottom of the spiral abyss, looking up at what appears to be a crescent moon. I say up because while our text prompt in game tells us to descend the spiral abyss, the truth is that all the stairways in the abyss go up, not down. We are climbing a tower, not descending it. To add to the confusion, on the highest floors of the Abyssal Moon Spire, floors 11 and 12, we are presented with a view of the moon and the galaxy band from really close up. This means that the spiral abyss is reaching up into the sky. So why is it called an abyss if it's in the sky? And why can't we see it from the ground? Why is the only entrance a portal that appears to go nowhere until you step through it? This may sound like a leap, but I think the spiral abyss and the gate of heaven are connected, both being points on opposite ends of the bubble-shaped firmament. Kind of like they're opposite ends of the same straw running through the bubble. The gate of heaven would be at the topmost point of the dome above Teyvat, while the abyssal moon spire is at the bottommost point of the firmament. But being at the center on the sphere and reaching the highest point in the sky means that these points would overlap with the trunk of the world tree, right? Well, yeah, and then that would imply that the shifting tower that makes up the spiral abyss actually exists within the world tree's primary trunk, where all of the energy and memories within the ley lines coalesce into pure primordial chaos. So, you know, some sort of extra dimensional energy vortex thing. And that would make the inside of the world tree the abyss? Uh, let's just uh, set that thought aside for now. We've talked a lot about how the branches of the world tree stretch across the sky of Teyvat, but we haven't talked at all about the roots. Logic dictates that if the branches of the tree are in the sky, then the roots must be beneath the ground, right? Well, no. The roots are forming a secondary sky on the opposite side of the firmament. This is the sky that I believe covers the other half of the biosphere, 
a starless sky because, you know, no Earmansul fruit can grow on roots. They grow on branches, not roots. No Earmansul fruit, no fate. No fate, no visions. No visions, no gods. Conria was said to be both underground and beyond the reach of gods. If the gods don't have any dominion over the sky formed by the roots of the tree, then it's likely that Conria is located somewhere beneath Tevat under the starless sky of the world tree's roots. Yes, I know I said in part two that Conria might not be underground at all. That's still a thing. Just hold your horses. Now, the roots of a tree have the role of sucking up nutrients and water that feeds the tree, and thus allows it to grow and photosynthesize. But the world tree doesn't suck up NPK and H2O, it sucks up ley line energy. And remember what I said about ley line energy just being raw elemental energy and memory data that could create a chaotic abyss-like space, possibly? Well, it just so happens that an abyss created of pure ley line energy within the world tree has a lot in common with the concept of the Sheol from Hebrew cosmology, which is located here, under the world of light. Now, the Sheol is traditionally the place where all the dead things go, and in Genshin, all the dead things go into the ley lines, so this correlation is totally sensible. So, given that the roots of the tree are constantly processing ley line energy, that doesn't leave much energy behind to support life, meaning the land around the roots would probably be rather barren. This would then match the description of what we know of Conria so far, and might help explain their proficiency with alchemy and the development of Chemia. They are effectively, constantly, surrounded by raw ley line energy which then becomes an abundant natural resource for them to tap into. This pseudo-abyssal space then possibly lines up with Child's story about falling into the abyss as a kid and fighting amongst the roots of a great tree. It would also explain how he met a person who was properly living there, and the sheer amount of ley line energy swirling around could also account for a warped passage of time. After all, ley line disorders have chaotic effects, even as in-game mechanics. I'm sure we all remember the slowing waters effect, yeah? That could be considered a form of time distortion, arguably. This would also explain why, in the We Will Be Reunited story trailer, Lumine is able to descend, yes, actually descend, what looks to be the Spiral Abyss corridor and end up on the outskirts of Conria. The Spiral Abyss is the corridor that passes through the abyss within the World Tree in an attempt to reach the dome of the firmament itself on either side. That would make the portal to Pylos Peak one of several possible entrances to the abyss itself, and that may be the location from which the pirates I mentioned in part two originally came from. Now all that aside, I did say that Conria is kind of underground, which I know is a fairly confusing statement in light of everything else I've said, but I said it because it's actually possible that Tevat is the underground nation, not Conria. This is based on a line from Mitternacht's Waltz, which reads, Every passion must be ground into dust by the march of time, before being turned into wild paranoia upon that inverted ancient tree. An inverted ancient tree, which I can only assume is referring to the world tree. That means that the tree itself is upside down. So if Tevat is near the branches and Conria is near the roots of the tree and the tree is upside down, then Tevat is actually below while Conria is actually above. And this is entirely possible given the bubble model. If a perfect sphere is suspended in water like we're suggesting with this world model, then up and down are completely relative to wherever the surface of the water is. If, in fact, Conria is above, then it's possible that the roots of the tree are facing the surface of the primordial waters. That means our world model doesn't look like this. It actually looks like this. And since the roots do not form a false sky or, you know, impose some sort of false destiny, it's possible that the people of Conria could see the true sky from beyond the dome of the firmament if it was close enough to the surface or floating upon it. When they speak of the abyssal light, they may be talking about the light of the original moons that hang in the true sky beyond the waters of the firmament. Gold and Conria, in their attempt to challenge the rule of Celestia, may have been trying to escape the firmament all along, viewing it as something akin to a prison. 
Rift Wolves gold created can erode the barriers between worlds, so perhaps this was an attempt at brute forcing their way out. Okay, let's have a quick recap of where we landed, because that was a lot of information. Basically, Tavod is a chunk of land and sea encased in a bubble-like barrier known as the firmament supported by the World Tree and its associated Pillars of Heaven, assisted by the Archons. The branches of the World Tree spread out to form the constellations of the night sky, the stars of which are made up of its fruit and control the destinies of mankind. Within this World Tree is an endless abyss made up of ley line energy, which in turn is then made up of all the memories, elemental energy, and data of everything that's ever existed within Tavod. The roots of the world tree cover the opposite end of the firmament, processing the ley line energy and fostering the people of Conria who were possibly able to see the true sky beyond the primordial waters and wish to be free of this perceived divine prison, which they are supposed to be in for their own safety, I guess. So that's it. This is the world of Genshin Impact. But I'm still left wondering, how did we get to here from here? What exactly does Tevat need to be hidden away from, anyway? Why is mankind being sequestered away in a big safety bubble? What exactly happened on this planet? Well, you'll just have to wait and find out in part four! Yes, you heard me right, part four. There is a part four. Now, there wasn't going to be, but the truth is that explaining the actual structure of the world and how it works was already complicated enough, and muddying it up with all the story and how it came to be and the way it would have happened would have just confused everyone, including me. So, next time we'll look into the origin story of Tevat and all of the events that I believe led up to the destruction of the planet and the creation of the Ark. And ironically, the Ark on War. <laughs> Anyway, thank you all so much for watching and being so patient while I put this together. It's been stressful, fun, frustrating, and educational all at once. And I really appreciate you guys sticking around with me. I absolutely cannot wait to share this next part with you. But until then, bon appetit. <laughs>